James Lloyd. Right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or as my body clock is telling me, good night. I'm, I'm, I'm still working on Hong Kong time, so if I, if I fall over at any stage, uh, please, please do revive me. Uh, delighted to be back here at Inner Tribe. I, this is now my fourth Inner Tribe. Um, now, I have to say, I started out as a startup in Inner Tribe about four years ago uh, as part of the Inner Tribe Challenge. So I'm very happy to follow on from what we've just seen with the, with the Russia Challenge. Uh, since that time, I've, I've moved laterally into the corporate world, and I, and I run EY's uh, Asia Pacific FinTech capability. So very happy to be here. Uh, again, supporting our friends at Swift, supporting our, our friends at Inner Tribe. And honestly, I think even in that four-year period, we've seen Inner Tribe become uh, much more of a central force within, within Cybos. So without further ado, I was given the day anchor host for Legacy. Um, and I kind of said, well, what do we mean by legacy? Uh, legacy, I think, in, 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 well, in many, many, many fields of life is considered a good thing. I mean, you bequeath your legacy to your family. You, legacy, hopefully you inherit some money as a consequence of legacy. But in technology, I guess legacy is generally considered to be a bad thing. Uh, legacy code, legacy software, legacy systems, all of which have somewhat negative connotations. Um, so I think as we talk about legacy today and as a, as a kind of a thread that, that, that kind of uh, weaving its way through some of these sessions, I also want to think about a, co a couple of other aspects of legacy. One is moving away from the system side. What about legacy people, uh, legacy processes? But equally, I want to talk about it from a positive perspective. Well, actually, legacy can be good, right? I was... Um, so I'm based in Hong Kong, as I mentioned. I, I held a, a, a session in, in Singapore just last week for, on the retail payment side for a number of, uh, as, I, as I described them, traditional and non-traditional players, or legacy and, and new, uh, you know, more fashionable, innovative players. But as it was pointed out to me by one of those legacy players, traditional legacy was just another way of saying they've got a proven ability to make money in the medium term. So I quite like that as we think about fintech, as we think about innovation, as we think about new. Actually, maybe it's not so bad having certain legacy characteristics if it means you've been around for 20, 30, 50 years. Anyway, I don't want to harp on about legacy all day, but I do want to consider some of the multifaceted aspects to it as we, as we move through through today's sessions. And I think we've got some great sessions. So I'm going to just give you a quick, quick run through of what the day is going to look like before we dive into our, our next session with Innovate High Stakes Environment. Uh, hopefully, you'll have seen uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee speak this morning on, on the past, present, and future of the internet. Again, some quite interesting legacy considerations there as he spoke about you know, the internet being developed without an underlying payments protocol, or the internet being developed uh, without a, a kind of a commercial imperative, which, which now uh, has a pretty considerable impact on its growth. Um, innovating in Russia, we heard from the three uh, Inner Tribe uh, Challenge startup finalists. And as I say, coming from that um, field myself, albeit from an Asia Pacific environment, uh, it was great to see. I'm going to give a little bit more detail now and in introduce uh, the, the team in relation to innovating in a high stakes environment. But really, the purpose here is to think about. Yeah, what can we learn from a financial services or technology perspective uh, from other uh, adjacent industries? Um, and, and I think we're going to have quite an interesting discussion there. FinTech hubs. I mean, everyone wants to be a hub these days. We, we know this is all the rage. Uh, in fact, I was at InnoTribe last year representing FinTech hubs in Asia Pacific, um, covering, covering as I do the market. But we've got some great speakers today, and we're going to have a great discussion, of which I'm just a participant, um, in relation to, you know, What's happening in Asia? I, I, I say to my colleagues and my friends in, in Europe or, or North America, you know, to speak credibly about what's happening in fintech, you need to understand what's happening in Asia, in particular in China, I think. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting discussion today. Uh, I recommend that you stick around for that. Around 2 p.m., we're doing uh, creating a space for innovation. So we've got Microsoft, BNY Mellon. Again, I think this is where we begin to understand, you know, what can we learn from financial services? What can we learn from adjacent industries? What are some of the principles? What are some of the technologies or platforms we can apply? Of course, walking around the floor uh, here in Tor Toronto Convention Center, you know, blockchain, AI, robotics. Uh, much, of the, uh, much of the usual buzzwords, let's be honest. So I think the question now is, well, 
what's real, what's not real, what can we apply to our business, what can we apply to our industry. Uh, so that's going to be a great session. With that in mind, I think one that I'm particularly looking forward to is in relation to AI and plain English. And I say that because I hear, gosh, I hear AI you know, a dozen times a day at the moment. I get pitched by two or three person startups that claim to be leveraging advanced AI and machine learning. And I kind of think, really? You don't really have access to any data. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're, but you know, I, I guess that's that's what fundraising will get you these days is a, is a nice uh, seed round or Series A if you can if you can talk about AI. This is going to be a great session because I think we're going to try and bring it back to reality a little bit and say, you know, who who does have this access to data? Who does have uh, the technical know-how to leverage some of this uh, big data that we keep hearing about? And then finally, again, very um, very topical. Security, I think, is one of those topics that, frankly, just underlines everything we do. Of course, as part of Intertribe, it's a focus of, uh, as part of Cybos generally, as part of all the bank, fintech participants in the ecosystem. Uh, and indeed, I think it ties nicely back to uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee at the start of today, talking about how the internet was initially constructed. And perhaps security wasn't the overriding principle uh, at the time. And, and, and I guess the, the thread being that's the legacy we've been left with, so, so how do we best deal with it? OK, great. So uh, you're know, very keen for today to be a pretty interactive session. We've got great speakers. Um, we're going to hear some presentations. We're going to hear some discussion. But I'm very keen to get as many questions from the audience and interaction as possible. Um, without further ado, I think we're going to kick off innovating in a high stakes environment. So if I can ask uh, the team up to uh, well, firstly, James, I think, firstly, is going to present in relation to James from Lloyd's List is going to speak um, on the insurance industry and securities industry having themselves kind of originated from the shipping industry. So again, I think this should be a pretty interesting discussion in relation to what we can learn, again, from a, an industry we don't perhaps think of in financial services, but in fact, the, the parallels are significant. So if you wouldn't mind just welcoming James Baker, who's going to present on the topic from Lloyd's List. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I just have to admit, when I um, signed up for this, I didn't realize I'd be speaking two people after, or two sessions after. So Tim Berners-Lee, so this is something of a hard act to follow, trying to talk about technology after him. Um, I've been asked here today to talk to you about legacy industries um, and how they're dealing with digital transformation. Um, you can tell I'm from a, le a, a legacy industry because I'm wearing a tie. Um, is this working? Yes. Um, I'll try to explain during this why, why I actually do that. Um, you may not think that the organization that I represent is really a legacy industry. I work in the media. Uh, what can be more hip and fashionable than working in the, uh, in the modern media? Um, it's, it's even if we are just purveying fake news these days. Um, well, here's the first reality check. The media is not cool. The part of it in which I work is, is even less cool than most others. But I think that's a good thing. Um, I represent an organization that has a, can trace its history back, its heritage back over 275 years. Um, and that's not a legacy. I don't know what is. For those of you that have never heard of uh, Lloyd's List, I expect that's quite a few of you. Um, here's a little history lesson. It's appropriate that we're here in a coffee shop environment today because that's where in the late 17th century, um, the original hipsters launched Lloyd's List. Now, Edward Lloyd was a early media entrepreneur um, who started Lloyd's List simply by tacking a list of ships coming in and out of the port of London to the wall of his coffee shop. And thus was the internet born, almost. Now, Lloyd's customers were <clears throat> financiers, traders, ship owners, people whose livelihoods depended on information, and this is exactly what Lloyd was able to give them. Now, the establishment was a, a popular place for ship owners, for merchants, for traders, seafarers, and Lloyd catered to them with reliable shipping news. Um, and the shipping community would go to the, the coffee shop to discuss maritime issues, to discuss insurance, shipbroking, trade. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Lloyd even had a, uh, a pulpit put into his, um, into his coffee shop where he could broadcast um, sort of maritime auction prices and uh, shipping news, make announcements, a uh, very early foray into broadcasting. And the deals that took place at, um, 
at, at the establishment he ended up leading on to bodies like Lloyd's of London, the insurance market, uh, Lloyd's Register, the, the ship registry business, um, and, and to several other shipping and insurance based uh, businesses grew out of it. Now, after Edward Lloyd died in 1713, um, the coffee shop passed on to his son-in-law in, -law in a, a, something that was to become a bit of a pattern for uh, um, the shipping industry over the next few hundred years, as uh, we shall see shortly. Um, by the mid-18th century, after a few changes of ownership, um, Lloyd's List settled down into a newspaper, um, an early version. Mind you, we'd done 560 issues by 1740, so. Admittedly, the, uh, the layout's changed a little bit since then. Um, <clears throat> and that's how things would have con continued um, had it not been for a fresh set of hipsters in another coffee shop um, that emerged in the late 1990s and early 2000s, these guys. Now, these ingrates, with no respect for tradition or history, um, thought they'd come up with their own idea of uh, publishing and distributing information. Uh, they liked the idea of the coffee shop, but printing was no longer fashionable. Thus, the internet was born, again, this time for real. Now, any of you have had the, the good sense to invest in Facebook, Google, any of these other new media companies over the last 20 years, uh, will know how successful the, the new coffee shop paradigm has become. And those of you that invested in print, old media, and newspapers have my deepest sympathy. So. Black Friday, 20th of December 2013, the final edition. What could be more um, galling to an old school newsman than to announce your capitulation with a hashtag? Well, lots of things really, um, including going out of business. By the time we shut down the print edition, less than 2% of our readers were getting their information purely from print. Um, and it was costing way too much in print cost distribution to, to satisfy this, this minority. So we had to make sacrifices um, along with changes. And so we did change. Um, we'd been online since the 1990s. We were publishing everything in the paper online first um, before we went to print. So the changes were not that significant. Um, and the reward was being able to survive in a fast changing media landscape where the old ways no longer applied. So that's the Lloyd's List story um, and how digital disruption has, has affected one industry. So what about shipping, the industry it covers? Well, arguably, shipping has been around even longer than Lloyd's List, just a little bit. Um, this is something of a hidden industry. It's uh, seldom fashionable, seldom talked about. Uh, a life at sea in times gone past was uh, something you had to be encouraged into by a press gang. But uh, according to oft-quoted figures from the International Maritime Organization, the UN body that, that covers and regulates shipping, um, shipping is responsible for the carriage of 90% of the world's um, physical goods and um, goods and commodities. Uh, they say that if, uh, half the, um, that if shipping didn't exist, half the world would freeze because there'd be no energy. Think about where your oil and coal comes from. Um, the other half would starve. Uh, there would be no food. Most of it's come from somewhere else. You may think that an industry that is so critical to the world's trading infrastructure might be at the cutting edge of technology, uh, but you would be wrong. Uh, shipping has, for thousands of years um, of its existence, been focused on one asset and one asset only, and that's the ship. Um, there's a very good reason for that. These ships are very expensive. The, last, the latest order for um, the largest container ships that have been signed in the last month uh, come in at north of 140 million each for a large container ship. And when you bear in mind that a container ship company, a, a, a shipping operation, will have hundreds of these, when we're not talking about small change for these vessels. That's what 140 million will buy you. And while the technology of these ships has changed dramatically over the years, um, ships are really just big floating steel boxes um, that are pushed along by some of the biggest and dirtiest engines um, known to mankind. It's, it's a very simple technology, just, just writ large. <clears throat> so since this, <clears throat> excuse me, since the age of sail, the focus has been on ships, um, making ships go faster, making them bigger, making them cheaper to run. 
But in terms of technology, there's been, you know, that's pretty much where things have stopped. In fact, it's said that the last major innovation in shipping came with the, the standard 20-foot container. Um, these have been around since early 1960s, so we haven't come very far since then. There's a number of reasons why shipping, and particularly container shipping, um, hasn't adopted new technologies. The main one is it hasn't needed to. Uh, what has worked has worked. Why innovate um, when you can make money without innovating? Um, another reason is that shipping is inherently conservative and traditional. It likes to wear its ties. Now, the big container lines of the late 20th and early 21st centuries have largely been family affairs. The largest container lines now, which are big European ones, Maersk Line, uh, Mediterranean Shipping Company, CMA, CGM, are all effectively family-run um, holdings. The, and this family ownership does not lend itself to innovative disruption. If, if you've got a model that works, why are you going to risk the livelihoods of your grandchildren just to try something different? So, how do you bring innovation to an industry that does not want to change? It can be offered, but this is a conservative industry, so, and not one that necessarily wants to be changed. Alternatively, it can be forced upon it. Um, now, the best way to do that is with a good recession um, that puts the survival of these companies at risk. Um, so, since the dawn of the internet era some 20, 25 years ago, um, bright people with good ideas and good technology have been trying to bring technology to shipping companies. But it's only been in the last two to three years that we've started to see anything really take off. And what's changed has been the emergence of a big recession in shipping that was largely self-inflicted. Um, companies bought too many of these big ships when times were good, but when the recession hit in 2008, there was too much capacity and not enough cargo to go around. Now, that led to a vicious price war as carriers competed with each other to try and fill their ships. A, a, a big ship running half empty does not make any money. <clears throat> the way to fill it is to reduce your prices. That leads to a rates war. That leads to nasty competition um, and a vicious price war. The denouement of this was that um, last year, we saw the collapse of Hanjin Shipping, a very major South Korean container line. Um, this led on to an unprecedented round of consolidation, mergers, and acquisitions, as seen the, the, the industry consolidate into fewer, larger operators. And shipping magazines get to write headlines like this, which is always fun. This, this was the disruption that the container shipping sector faced, um, and it was here that Finally, digital technology started to get a, get a foothold as companies attempted to find a way of becoming profitable again. Now, there's been much talked about this and written about this in the past 12 to 18 months, and a lot of that is hyperbole. Um, and it usually involves the word blockchain, um, which might, given the right circumstances, come to something in the years ahead. Although I would uh, challenge pretty much any shipping executive to describe what a blockchain is. But shipping is a transactional business. Um, getting a pair of sports shoes from a factory in China to a store in Toronto requires a huge number of steps to be taken, a large number of tra transactions between various parties. From the factory, the shoes will go to a logistics operator who will be responsible for getting them to a distribution center. From there, they will go to a, a port where they'll be put onto a ship. Um, a few weeks later, they show up at another, another port be put on another truck, taken to another distribution center. Uh, finally, they'll make it, to, make it to the store to be sold. Now, that can take up to 200 interactions with documentation all along the supply chain. Um, and there can be up to sort of different, 28 different entities with which a shipper will have to deal with. So you've got customs, the terminals, forwarders, carriers. All of those steps require a bit of paper or an electronic equivalent. There's a purchase order, a receipt, a trade finance agreement, insurance, uh, the verification of the gross mass of the container. If you've got hazardous goods, then it needs uh, 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 clearance for the and certification, um, a bill of lading, blah, 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 the list goes on and on. Um, and 
the amount of paper is vast and, and the amount of time and expense is vast as well. Moreover, the, I mean, this is relatively recent and you can see how old that is. Um, the documentation has not changed much over the last 200 years. It's still very similar. But this is exactly where digital technologies can help the container shipping sector. Although much of this has been attempted before, like I say, and uh, we haven't come that far yet. Blockchain is a, a, an obvious, um, and can play an obvious and critical role in what is very much a transactional, multi-party environment. Um, but the issue in the past has not been the, the technology, but the culture. And much of this is out of the hands of the technology companies and, the, and even the shipping lines. Some of the problems faced come from regulators. Many exporting nations have a penchant for bureaucracy. And many of those bureaucrats still like to have things written out and, and have bits of paper with rubber stamps. And no amount of technology is ever going to take the place of a man in a uniform wielding a rubber stamp. There's another more contemporary threat as well. This year, um, Maersk, the world's largest container line, was hit by the, the NotPetya cyber attack, which I'm sure all of you are well aware of. This took down its operations for over a week. Now, for a company like Maersk, which takes 90% of its bookings online, um, this was a disaster. It, it cost, um, it's expected to, to have cost over $300 million for being offline for just a period of just a few weeks. Due to the scale of that attack, Maersk wasn't able to hide it um, and had to come public. For the first time, a major shipping company came out and said it had been attacked. Uh, this was a watershed for shipping lines and in that it made the whole industry sit up and take notice for change. Uh, this was the, you know, if this could happen to Maersk, it could happen to anybody. Which has meant information security has come right to the top of the boardroom um, schedule now. It's, it's the top priority. But at the same time, it has raised even more questions over the challenges of doing business digitally. This is not an industry that likes to, well, that takes to disruption kindly. Um, and taking on new technologies that add to the risk of doing business uh, can still seem like a step too far. But some of the resistance to change has come from the people with the technology, uh, attempting to, because they've attempted to change the way shipping companies do business. We, we wrote an, er, an editorial in Lloyd's List several years ago. Um, we stated that you know, shipping companies do not like being pushed around by entrepreneurs. They've got their own ways of doing things. And those that emerge successfully will have to learn the, his, the lessons of history that, that it's not about technology, it's about business processes. And importantly, it's about getting the carriers on board and embracing changes in business processes and assisting them to do this. So looking at the landscape that's emerging right now, it's, it seems like some players have learned the lessons and are becoming more business focused and focus on the processes instead of the technology. But there are others that still go out of their way to explain the brilliance of their technology without realizing that it's not the technology that is the most important part. Many of the issues that are uh, that those offering the solutions are looking at only a small part of the picture as well. By some estimates, um, half of all bookings are still done manually, um, <clears throat> while a third of all invoices are still reported to contain errors. Um, and this despite e-commerce being around for 15 years in, in shipping. Um, so true disruption of the market is only likely to become possible when new technology is, it, uh, initiatives are combined with operational documentation, information, and financial flows across the whole supply chain. And this will mean working closely with the industry itself. There have been some steps to do this in an effort to achieve something like this. Um, the French carrier CMA CGM um, only last week announced that it was launching a startup incubator in, near its headquarters in Marseille um, in an effort to foster technologies that, can ultimately, that it can ultimately utilize. So although many of the efforts will be thwarted, um, it's worth noting that the recession in shipping that has so badly damaged the industry uh, has almost sown the seeds of change. So unlike publishing, shipping may not 
quite yet have found its own modern coffee shop, but I would think that it's at least starting to show the signs that it's on its way. Thank you. <laughs> James, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to grab a seat yeah. here. Um, very interesting. I, I, I've got a few notes I think I'm going to challenge you on. But I think before we do that, if we could invite up uh, John Lee from TMX Group as well. And John, perhaps I could ask, first of all, for you to give a quick introduction as, as to who you are and what you do, after which maybe we can get into a bit of a discussion based on James's presentation. I didn't realize you were going to talk about ties, but I actually <laughs> don't have one on, so sorry about that. Um, my name's John Lee. I'm the, uh, I'm the Vice President, Head of Innovation and Enterprise Delivery at TMX Group. For those of you um, that may be out of town and are not quite sure what TMX Group is, uh, TMX Group is actually a collection of organizations uh, dealing with capital markets. So we have several stock exchanges, the, the major Canadian ones, the Toronto Stock Exchange, Venture Exchange. We also have the Montreal Exchange, the Natural Gas Exchange, uh, as well as our clearinghouses, so CDS and CDCC, um, and the National Depository. So that's why we call it TMX Group. It's basically uh, one unit that was formed as a result of the, um, the Maple transaction that took place in 2012. Excellent. Welcome, John. So I, I guess what we want to do here is have a little bit of a discussion based on the presentation. Um, I think, as we mentioned from the start, uh, the objective here is really to uh, understand other industries. You know, what can we learn from that relative, I guess, specifically to banking financial services here. But equally, I'm very keen to open it up to the room. So if people have questions as we go, please just raise a hand. Uh, equally, uh, you know, we'll leave time specifically for that purpose at the end. Um, I mean, I guess just kicking off from my perspective, James, I, I mean, I, I mean as, as I went, I said a couple of things. Firstly, I, I mean, I, I'm based in Hong Kong. I've lived there for the past uh, six or seven years very much a shipping town, mm. uh, but equally a financial services town. Um, so it was interesting to me to hear a, a couple of aspects from your own perspective about how shipping, of course, has been resistant to change for many years, because first and foremost, it hasn't needed to change. Mm. And I think we could say banking is very similar in that regard. Uh, equally, that when it comes to innovation, which is probably one of these words that gets a bit more uh, airtime than it should, but when it comes to fundamental business change, um, it's often not really about the new technology that exists. Yeah. Uh, and I think taking the theme of legacy, it's, it's legacy culture, legacy people, which, which is positive in some regards, negative in others. Are there specific lessons that we can take from the shipping industry and apply to financial services? And um, for, for either of you here, I mean, it's tough. I, th I think John's probably better placed to answer that one than I am. But, um. <laughs> well, the, the one thing, you know, James, when I look at um, you know some of the challenges that you have in, in in the shipping industry, I am not a shipping expert by any means. You obviously are. Um, I'm more of an expert in in capital markets, uh, the securities business, etc. But the challenges that you guys are having are so similar to to the the struggles that we as an organization have as well. Um, not just the exchange, but also the the industry as a whole. Uh, if, you, if you draw the parallels and, and you think about where shipping was and where containers was, think of the stock exchange. You know, the, the TMX is, uh, is 160 years old. It's actually older than Canada. And if you think about the transformation that we've done, th there really are only a couple of major, I'll call them breakthroughs. And, and you know, for those of you that have watched any type of a, of a movie, th there used to be a trading floor. A bunch of crazy guys with funky jackets all waving hands, paper flying all over the place. And if you think about that, um, sure, there are still some pockets of that that exist in the world today, m mainly in the future space. But if you think about the equities markets, they've matured significantly. They are not paper driven anymore. They're all electronic. That was a major transformation. We did that in, uh, in, in the better part of, of the 90s to try and figure out what is the standards on how you can actually go and communicate with each other. That last trade that took place uh, you know, was, was almost 20 years ago, if you think about it. And it, it's crazy when you, when you think about how you move from a paper-based manual way of actually facilitating a transaction to where it is today. And, and I firmly believe with a lot of these technologies that are coming, 
we are on the cusp of yet another massive transformation similar to that. And so when I look at some of the big recession hits in, mm. in the container business, you, you think about where we are as a market as well. And, and you know, sure, recessions aren't necessarily good for the exchange business, um, but you know, our, our volumes have been stagnant for the last few years. If you think about companies that are trying to raise capital, it's been steadily declining for the last few years. And it's not that the innovation movement isn't happening, it actually is. Yeah. It's just not happening in the traditional sense. And yeah. so you can start to see a fundamental shift. I think, I think one of the lessons that has come to me from this is that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the slowdown in your own industry. It's, that leads to moves to cut costs, and this is where innovation is usually driven from, this idea that you know, if we get rid of open outcry trading, then we can get rid of all these expensive you know, floor bidders. Yeah. Um, you know, we had that happen in the, in the UK markets in, with the Big Bang in the 1980s when the whole Bang banking line, yeah. and stock market sector was changed. Um, in, in shipping, it's been this idea of you know, if we can get rid of having people filling in forms, uh, the number of telephone calls that are still made to get a transaction done to find out you know, where a container is and, and whether it's been offloaded yet and so on. Um, a lot of this stuff, in theory, the technology there is, is there to, to automate these processes yeah. and, and make these things happen. Um, but I think my point is that the, until you can get over that cultural challenge, then it, it makes it harder for those cost savings to I, I totally agree with you on the, on the cultural yeah. challenge one, because mm -hmm. if, if you think about how you can actually go and innovate, um, you can't really go and innovate by yourself. You can't just go and say, I'm going to go and innovate for the industry and everyone's just going to do it. And it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, it's really trying to figure out how you can work in a different way, an alternative way. Um, but not only be able to do that, but you need to share that knowledge and get the buy-in yeah. from the industry to actually go and mobilize. And that's, that's a big challenge. That's not something that you can do and, overnight. And, and one thing, the, you know, the shipping industry, you know, we had Tim Berners-Lee this morning talking about the W3C consortium. So we don't have that. We have a bunch of individual companies all trying to do their own thing, do it better. I mean, there, there, there have been some instances. There's an organization called Intra, which is a sort of a joint booking system for, for containers, um, which was put together by a group of container carrier, the container lines. But uh, you know, we have CMA CGM doing its own inc incubator, um, but that's to develop technology for itself. And I guarantee that Maersk is busy doing the, its, its own thing as well. So having this sort of uh, critical meeting point where that can become an industry-wide standard yeah. is, is a really important thing. And I'm not sure how easy that is in a diversified uh, market like this. Well, I mean, let me jump in there. And I should say, by the way, from EY are actually work, publicly working with Maersk uh, and Microsoft in relation to a, a blockchain yeah, insurance yeah, well, they solution. Did, they, no, they did their famous but, trial. This but year. Let, me, let me just challenge us all a little bit. And I think let me challenge Intertribe a little bit as well in that I'm kind of inherent, despite having FinTech in my title, I'm inherently skeptical of this idea of innovation. I mean, what, you know, how do we innovate? How do we drive innovation? What does it all mean? I mean, ultimately, you, you innovate, if that's even a thing, ultimately what you want to do is improve the fundamentals of your business, improve mm. your competitive position, yeah. or make more money or reduce costs. I, don't, I, I think innovation as an objective, I think, is a little too fluffy. Yeah. So the reason, I, that's just a personal view, the reason I, I say that is, you know, in an industry like shipping, you mentioned the recession and the impact that's had, and people have had to find costs. And, and yes, that leads to perhaps some ingenuity in how they find yeah. those costs. Mm. But are there fundamental threats to the industry that could drive fundamental change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, everybody talks about you know, the, the, the Uber effect or the Airbnb effect. Um, that's not yet come to shipping. We, we, you know, uh, there are, there's always a perceived threat that Amazon is going to start, you know, either buying its own ships or, or finding you know, some way of taking over the industry. It's a, a, a big sort of background fear there. Mm. Um, you know, fortunately, it costs an awful lot of money to start up a shipping company. It's not something you can, mm. there are fairly high barriers to, to entry. Um, 
but there's this perceived fear. Nobody knows what it'll be yet, but everyone's still waiting for the kid in the basement to, to come up with some you know, true innovation, something that changes the model of how the business is done. Um, it hasn't happened yet. We haven't had the, the Uber moment in, okay. in shipping yet. Okay. But I think people are starting to think, you know, is there something going on in the background that we, you know, we don't yet know about? And I think... Uh, uh, an awareness of that is driving some of this, that there, there could be some you know, as yet unknown challenger out there. I mean, I think you could, in the capital market space as well, I mean, I think perhaps it's nearer oh, yeah. term that we can think about genuine oh, yeah. threats to the basic fundamental business model of, well, the, you know, not to the, put you on the spot, but I mean. So, so <laughs> sure, they're, they're definitely, I mean, even this organization, uh, Swift in general, uh, is, is under threat. The entire industry, in a way, is, is, mm. is under threat if you, uh, you know, are ignoring those trends, then sure, it's a threat. But one of the things that you need to look at is how can you actually go and harness some of this stuff? I mean, the the worst thing that you can do is just kind of push it off to say off to the side and say it's a fad. I I, I think that's probably um, a mistake. And if you do that, uh, at it, it really would be at your own detriment. Yeah. And maybe, you know, in our industry, it's a little bit more obvious. If you think about the inefficiencies in, in how we move money internationally, how we can deal with settlement of securities transactions, you know, it, it is in a lot of ways efficient, but it's inefficient as well. So these emerging technologies that have come out, specifically blockchain and even to an extent some of the machine learning and AI stuff that's out there, mm. there are tons and tons of potential technology solutions that can go and solve this problem. Mm. And, you know, what do they not have that we have? Mm. And what do we have that they don't have, right? I think, in, I think in, it's sort of, you know, one of the things, I mean, to take your industry, um, the little I know about it, I mean, yes, you can have the, the improvements through cost-cutting, digitalization, to save costs, improve your business technologies. All right, is that innovation? Probably not. Bitcoin comes along. Mm. That's an innovation. That's a try, that's and a try, yeah. that is something that can unsettle your entire so business. So actually to answer the question, it, you know, what has spurred the attention of this particular audience in this industry is, is really that competitive threat. It mm. was, you know, even if I look at Cybos a year ago, mm. what the hell was blockchain? What is that? What does that mean for me? Is this something that's actually going to disintermediate me or not? Mm. I need to learn more. And at that point, you know, 12 months later, here we are, we're having the same dialogue and discussion. And I would like to think that a lot of the audience now goes, okay, now I have an idea of what blockchain is. I can kind of see how the space has moved at an extremely rapid pace. And by next year, you can now start to see production deployments of this to actually realize, okay, wait a minute. That actually is something that I need to pay attention to. And you actually come down to the conclusion that you're either going to go and embrace this to see how it could transform your business, or you're going to wait to see some other organization that has got that right, has the regulatory licensing done, and now can become your business. And that's really the, pr the crux of it. And, and that could be applied to banking. Mm -hmm. That could be applied to the stock exchange industry. Yeah. It could be applied to logistics and so on and so on. I mean, I'd still be interested to poll all 8,000 people uh, at Cybos as to what they actually think blockchain is, but perhaps that's for another day. <laughs> yeah. Um, any kind one. of questions from the floor for John or James? I mean, I, I guess what we tried to do is bring some pretty divergent industries, um, one of which is fully digitalized in effect, mm. and one of which, <laughs> I mean, yeah. cannot be digitalized. Well, no, you can't digitalize uh, a ship. You, uh, you've unless got a people are product that has. I, to be. I mean, unless people are manufacturing locally. I mean. You know, well, perhaps this, in a medium-term yeah. view, we I'm, talk about 3D yeah. printing. We talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, near, near sourcing, near shoring has become a you know a, a big. You know, these are the innovations that are becoming threats. 3D printing, maybe that's going to take off. Who knows? Um, I think it will become a lot more relevant. Um, mm. If you can, you know, if you can print your own pair of trainers in Toronto, you don't need to ship them from 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 a factory in China. The other thing that's becoming more interesting uh, that's come up recently is the whole idea of robotics and apparently you know most of the robotics that are being sold at the moment are being sold into low um, wage economies like Southeast Asia mm -hmm. that's the biggest market for, for robotics now if they're finding it cheaper to buy a robot than to pay somebody a few farthings a day um, to make you know sports shoes then 
if it's viable for them, then why is it not viable to start buying them in Canada and making those products here? Um, so when that happens, again, you, you no longer need these, these big trade lanes of... And, and you know, equally, I think we'll see... I mean, we're already seeing political pressures in that regard. Mm. I mean, I think one thing perhaps that does have a commonality across all, the, all these industries is, you know, actually the, the impact of regulatory and policy decisions. Mm. Um, I mean, we've already heard some of the big U.S. tech firms yep. make uh, noises about, you know, manufacturing in the U.S. and mm. so on because of the kind of political landscape yep. and so on. Mm. That, of course, would have an impact yeah. uh, for shipping, equally financial services. Probably one of the most heavily regulated industries around. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone in financial services likes to say that because they want to avoid more. Oh, trust me, I've got 13 <laughs> regulators that I have to report to every three months. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely there. And I think you know, to, to your question around innovation, it really is changing the way we think, changing the way we operate. And everyone always focuses on the technology itself, but I completely agree. That's probably the easiest part. It's actually yeah. the, the leader. Yeah. It's actually the enabler. The, the real challenge is how do you get the regulatory environment to actually go and figure out how to adopt this and bring it into the incumbent space. And I think, you know, the legacy organizations that have been regulated for a long time actually do have the, uh, the upper advantage on that side of the mm -hmm. fence, on that side of the debate, and it's really for theirs to lose, right? And if it's something that they choose to ignore, then eventually they, you know, a lot of these other organizations that are competing for your business mm -hmm. will crack that. And, mm -hmm. and once they get there, the, the status quo will quickly erode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. I, I mean, the technology point. I mean, if you come to this conference 20 years ago, I would have been giving the speech about how you know electronic data interchange and client-server computing were the big new things. The big thing. um, yeah. Now we're talking about blockchain and the cloud. Um, it, the technology's changed. The issues are still exactly the same mm, in terms same. of getting those technologies adopted and making them relevant for the. It, it the really business. is the enabler. If you think about you know, how much advancement has come in terms of just raw computing power and mm. just how cheap that is. Yeah. It, it just, you know, everyone in this room has a phone. Mm. That phone is 20 times more powerful than any computer that's been around 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, that computer costs a fortune. Yeah. Barring the Apple iPhone costs, which I think is crazy. <laughs> but, you know, think about what's in your hand right now. Yeah. And, and you just realize, wow, how on earth did that happen? Yeah. And even if you go back 10, 15 years, yeah. no one would have thought that a phone that was traditionally used for just mm. having a, an actual communication yeah. is now your lifeline for pretty but, much everything. But I still think the point is it's until you find a, a way of fitting that into the business processes, yes. no matter how much computing power, because you know, 15, 15 no, years ago, absolutely the, right. the, the you power was... You find that business, the, you know, the business use case that actually yeah. can harness this yeah. and actually move forward, because mm -hmm. um, if you yeah. don't, it's just basically technology looking for a problem. Mm. Okay, well look, on that basis, I think we're at time. Uh, hopefully, um, I mean, if, if folks have, have questions, we're gonna be hanging around, grabbing a coffee. Oh, Ham. Oh, we do have time, okay. I thought you were signaling that I had no, no time No, 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 that's, that, that's the next cue I'm gonna give you. Um, Godfrey's last question to Sir Tim Berners-Lee was about security, right? And I think about, and we talked yesterday about identity. And for shipping, yeah. how do you know that people, what they say is in the container, is in the container, is and at the scale mm. of that, it seems hard, right? Yeah. And I think, hmm. how do you guys think about identity yeah. and security hmm. in it's, your industry, and yeah. are there parallels? It, it, it's, a, it's a massive, massive issue, particularly in terms of um, uh, the hazardous goods thing. Uh, it's there are some things that if you put in a container, shake them around out at sea, will catch fire. Um, <clears throat> that can cause very big problems. There's been some very notable cases of ships going down or, or container stacks collapsing. It's been a big, big issue. It's, it's a bit esoteric, but um, and there are technologies out there. Hapag Lloyd, the, the German carrier, came up with a basically a word spotting algorithm for all the fake words that people were using to try and cover up that something was um, calcium hypochlorite, which is a very flammable product, um, calling, it, calling it bleach, calling it plant food, calling it growth enabler, whatever. Um, and you know they very sort of honorably gave that to IBM to develop as a product for the rest of the industry, which I think was a, you know, a, a great move. But yeah, this, this thing of, you know, the, the, 
<laughs> millions of boxes going around the, the world every year. You don't know what is in a lot of those, uh, you know, this issues of smuggling, yada, yada. Um, and this is where, you know, uh, blockchain, despite the hype, if you can find a means, and you know, you guys working on this with Maersk, it's trying to establish identity, establish a, you know, a, a chain of proof, a chain of ownership, um, something that's irrevocable so that you know. Yeah, there is huge scope there. If somebody can come up with the right model, the right idea, get the right buy-in for that, then that will solve or help solve some very fundamental issues and, of, of what's going on. Um, but it's... You know, I still think there's some way to go, and I think it needs a lot more de development. And at the moment, people are working in silos trying to find their own way of doing it. You know, Maersk did a great trial trying to do a, you know, a, a blockchain transaction the whole way from, you know, shipping stuff from Europe to the US, everything done digitally, all the custom sign off, everything. Now, that's great, but we need the whole industry to be able to do that, and not just one carrier on one very easy line. You know, if you're taking you know, jurisdictions in, in, um, in, in, I think they did it from Denmark or Germany, through to the US, it's very easy to do things <clears throat> digitally there. Trying to do that between you know, the Philippines and South Africa, mm, good luck with that. Uh, so, yeah. Great, thank you, Ham. So listen, I think on that, on that basis, um, if you could please join me in thanking uh, James and John for their contribution. And as I say, we'll be around to take uh, any questions on blockchain in the shipping industry that you might have. Thank you. Great, thanks guys. So I think we're on for a coffee break. But yeah. So it's back for APAC FinTech Hub. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So I'm still operating on Hong Kong time, so obviously I have no idea what uh, part of proceedings we're at. But in fact, we're breaking now for, um, for effectively for coffee and lunch. We'll be back at 12.45 uh, for the APAC FinTech Hubs discussion. As mentioned earlier, if you don't know what's happening in Asia Pacific, you don't know what's happening in FinTech. Um, before that, just two final pieces of note. Um, one, we've got the uh, aquarium party Wednesday night, tomorrow night. I see Mike Segal at the back of the room, so he, he'll, be, uh, he'll be giving a bit of a song and dance, I think, Mike, right, as part of that party. <laughs> um, so please join us. I, I think you need to register. Uh, so this is not a very easy register link, in fact, if you're sitting in the audience. But you know, maybe we can help you out. I think there's some cards uh, on, the, on, on the table. So please join us tomorrow night. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. The aquarium is just next door. One other item of note. Um, you may have seen, I'm sure you have done, that there was an earthquake in Mexico last month. Uh, in fact, the most devastating in, in, in three decades. Um, I think SWIFT have very generously um, uh, uh, committed to any contribution you make for coffee. We've got a couple of boxes out, uh, outside. If you add some dollars or yen or whatever you might have, pounds, uh, SWIFT will very generously contribute, match any donation. So please do contribute. The coffee is free, but a quick donation will be uh, well worth it. Thank you again for your time. See you at 12.45 for FinTech APAC Hubs. Great. Right.